So information provided upon request is something that Hong Kong brought in from Australia that Australia brought in from the state of Delaware in the United States. And essentially, in information provided on request, that we find the key provision in Section 740 of the ordinance. And there are two criteria that the member must be acting in good faith and the member must have a proper purpose. We also have a limit to prevent a single member with a single share of stock from having recourse uh, to this right by drawing a limit at 2.5% of the votes or 50 members uh, to make this request. Now this request will go to the court and then the court will authorize the inspection. And as all of the various provisions in part 14, which include derivative actions, unfair prejudice actions, these sorts of requests and requests for injunction like we saw in David Chen, the non-Hong Kong company would have to comply as well. This does not include uh, access to information subject to professional privilege, trade secret, or private data. But it would certainly include information that would allow you to sue a director. So this sort of request could be used prior to filing a derivative action if the plaintiff did not have enough information to plead in detail the misconduct of a given director. It would be possible to use this in order to request information and that would be considered a proper purpose. In Veron International, uh, what we see is a very nice analysis of the relationship between the first kind of disclosure that we discussed, which is regular or annual disclosure, and this ad hoc disclosure, which is provided upon proper purpose. So Veron is a member in the listed company, RCG Holdings, and the company has a uh, mainland Chinese subsidiary that was engaged in a couple of transactions. These transactions were disclosed to a certain extent in the prospectus when the company was listed on the Stock Exchange of Hong Kong. And Veron, from the information provided and the price of the resale of these assets that were bought in the hundreds of millions and then sold in the ten or three thousand uh, dollar range, uh, Veron suspected that there was something going on. And Veron decided that the information provided in the press release uh, that must be given under the rules of the Stock Exchange of Hong Kong was not complete. The Court of First Instance looked at this and decided that the request of information for a proper purpose was something which is in lieu of the annual reporting done by a listed company. And so therefore, this particular right should be something which is emphasized in unlisted companies rather than listed companies. And because here, RCG Holding had, in fact, disclosed information according to the rules of the Stock Exchange of Hong Kong, the request of information for a proper purpose was no longer available. The Court of Appeal reversed this and found that there is not a different standard among listed and unlisted companies when applying the former equivalent of Section 740 that we now find in the company's ordinance, and that both may be applied and the court should look carefully at the information which was actually disclosed and the information which is requested under Section 740 to decide whether the request was in good faith 
and for a proper purpose. So no distinction between listed and unlisted companies and the availability judged on a case-to-case -case basis of both forms of disclosure. The last form of disclosure is registers available to members and others, to the public generally, to a great extent. And this is the oldest form of disclosure. Um, the annual disclosure developed primarily in stock exchanges around the turn of the century, 1911, it was introduced into the uh, British uh, company law and then found its way into most stock exchange rules and securities laws like the Securities and Futures Ordinance and currently the companies winding up in miscellaneous provisions ordinance. Um, registers, however, had been around for a long time and you've learned already about the register of members and how we deal with the register of members when we have an allotment of shares. We have not looked at the register of charges yet, and we will not. You'll look at that in your commercial law course. So the register of members, remember that the only persons who count as members of a company are those persons found in the register. And the register will provide information on the extent of their holding and their name. However, note that in a listed company, for reasons basically of transaction speed, uh, it is traditional to register a nominee of a depository as the main or perhaps only shareholder of a company. And in Hong Kong, we have the Central Clearing and Settlement Service, CCAS, which is the often the only registered member of a listed company. I'll go through very, very briefly why this is the case. So here is the Stock Exchange of Hong Kong at the top. Uh, we have an order placed uh, by one participant. We have a counter order. Uh, the trade will be matched to, uh, to sell or buy some securities. Uh, and then the central counterparty, uh, for reasons that we don't need to go into here, uh, takes over as the buyer to all the sellers and the seller to all the buyers. Now, the way that the central counterparty can then very quickly execute this trade is because all of the participants have agreed to keep their shares of stock in accounts in the central clearing and settlement service. So essentially, the transfer of shares on the stock exchange take place between the accounts of CCAS and they continue to be owned by CCAS, and CCAS remains the only member. This can be disaggregated, but things become a bit more expensive. And so if the particular company you're dealing with has not disaggregated the ownership, you may find that only one member is shown in the register of members, and that is CCAS. And then CCAS will have a contractual duty to pass on the voting rights and dividends that it receives to its participants, which would be banks, and also to the ultimate um, customers of these banks. Uh, by the same token, uh, the central counterparty has access to the cash and that's, uh, that's through a similar system of accounts maintained in Hong Kong with the help of the Monetary Authority, but we won't go into that here. 